Welcome to the Holy Post. This week, we have world-renowned New Testament scholar N.T. Wright back on the show. He's written an entire book about Romans 8 and how many of its themes, including glorification and even salvation, are widely misunderstood. And the chapter's most famous verse about how all things work together for good probably doesn't mean what you think it means. And for Holy Post Plus subscribers, we have a bonus conversation with pastor and Holy Post pundit Glenn Packiam, where we discuss the practical implications of N.T. Wright's view of Romans, so you don't want to miss that. Also this week, how oversimplifying the history of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is leading to some very bad takes about the current war. And then David French has a new article explaining why devotion to Trump will not break among some Christians— leading me and Caitlin into a debate about the roles of reason and emotion in politics. few more quick announcements. This Friday, October 20th, we're launching another brand new Holy Post subseries called Are the Kids All Right? In each of these episodes, we interview a different expert on what's happening with young people today in our culture and in the church. This series is a must for parents, teachers, and anyone else engaged in youth ministry. And this is your last week to sign up and try Holy Post Plus for free. You'll get access to all the bonus shows and interviews, merchandise, and live streams. So go to holypost.com and sign up today. Here is episode 587. Hey, this is Phil. Welcome back to the Holy Post Podcast. I am here with Caitlin Chess. Hi, Caitlin. Hi, Phil. See, you don't. You never know who I'm going to say first, do you? I usually do know, and it's not me. <laughs> oh, okay. And Sky Jatani. Hi, Sky. Hi, Phil. This guy doesn't care. He's like, whatever. First, second, third, <laughs> twelfth. I'll get to him eventually. Um, and we're just going to jump right in because now it's time for the theme song. What's the news that you like the most? Who's your favorite podcast host? If it's breakfast, get your toast. It's Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. And sometimes Caitlin. This episode of The Holy Post is sponsored by Faithful Counseling. In my 50 years on this earth, life has thrown me more than a few curveballs. The loss of a dream, rough spots in relationships, challenges in parenting, even though friends and family and strangers on Facebook are always ready with advice, my wife Lisa and I have found it tremendously helpful to sit down with a professional therapist. And you can too. Faithful Counseling can help you find a therapist that works for you. With more than 3,000 licensed therapists across all 50 states, it's easy and free to change counselors until you find the right fit. It. Plus, it's more affordable than traditional in-office counseling and financial aid is available. Whether you're struggling with family conflicts, trauma, anxiety, stress, or depression, Faithful Counseling can match you with a Christian therapist who can help. Continue growing into the best version of yourself. Visit FaithfulCounseling.com slash Holy Post and get the professional, faith-based counseling you need. They've even got a special offer for our listeners. Right now, you can get 10% off your first month at FaithfulCounseling.com slash Slash Holy Post. And thanks again to Faithful Counseling for sponsoring this episode. Okay, Caitlin, anything interesting in your life in the last. We haven't talked to you in two weeks. No, we talked That's to you last true. week. You were here last week. week. That's yeah. right. What, yeah. what happened last week? Anything, anything interesting on the campus of Duke? Not really. I think some sports have been played, but I wasn't really paying attention to them. Football team has been doing well, but you yeah. don't care. There okay. were, I met three different people in Durham this last week who listened to the Holy Post and were in town for the football game. So Wow. Wow. They, that's, okay, there that's is cool. some overlap between interest in Duke football and the Holy Post. Not, it's just not, Did I'm not you, included in that overlap. <laughs> no, you are not. I'm curious. You're how this really came interested up. in neither, to a certain extent. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. What do you mean, Sky? <laughs> like, did they know you were on the Holy Post? And yeah. Like, oh, Caitlin. I oh, yeah. Like someone in okay. public that was just like, oh, and I don't live here. I'm just here for, huh. for the. And game. they what they see they see you and recognize you or how did they? Yeah. Oh wow. Wow. See, I Does don't that think that. Does that happen to you? Maybe well, not not a lot. I think people are too intimidated by me because I look like a, I look like <laughs> I'm not very a villain in a movie. Yeah. But but no. if if the people that came into town for the football game, I can't imagine you in you were mingling with a whole bunch of the football crowd. 
It was like one was at the mall, one was on campus. Yeah, so I'm was, so I'm just yeah, saying just other places. If just among the football in towners that you bumped into, three of them knew you. Imagine if we'd put your face on the jumbotron at oh, halftime. Yeah. There would have been like they would have done the wave in I don't your know honor. About that. <laughs> That's like, I, I would say we can probably project to like at least, you know, 10% of Duke football fans are also fans of wow. Caitlin Chess and the Holy Post podcast. I don't so know about that. But. Thousands and thousands of Duke football fans that are fans of the, maybe not. You should get a cut because, I mean, you're clearly helping recruitment. You're to like Duke. a student celebrity. I, I yeah. will say yeah. I have also had multiple students this year say that their pastor or one of their professors or one of their parents was worried about them going to Duke because it's a scary liberal place and said, oh, but Caitlin Chess is there. So maybe it's fine. Oh, <laughs> that's I thought they were going to say because Caitlin no, Chess No, 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 no. I was reassuring to them, Sky, of my so, orthodoxy. Okay. That's good. Yeah. Does that mean oh. that you that you have to connect with these kids to make I sure have, they have them, a yeah. safe, safe space? And you have a little support group. Are you starting a little support group for no. people who this is just for the Duke Divinity students that went to Liberty and <laughs> Dallas? There are and none are of now, those. And there are, now are Duke. zero of this those. This is for us. Come together, no. everyone. Let us. There gather. are a lot of Wheaton students though that show up to Duke. Really? So really, there's a pi- mm. we're making a pipeline that already existed, but we're strengthening it. Okay. Okay. I'm not sure how, though, how I feel about that. Neither Phil nor I went to Wheaton. No. Yeah, but you feel kind of, you know, We're part Wheaton-y. of the institution. We're Wheaton-y. Mm. Yeah. Wheaton. I don't know if Wheaton wants to claim us, though. Wheaton-ish. What? We haven't we haven't done anything that bad. No, Sky. but like, you know, I don't think they're going to put Phil or Sky on the fundraising flyers they send well, no, out. No, it's because we know? didn't it's attend not... the school. Exactly. But they don't want, I don't know if they want oh. an affiliation or not. Oh, okay. That's fine. Nope. Okay. okay. Whatever. What? We may say something. Whatever. I do not... I I have I always have light stories in the hopper. I'm not going to do any light stories because this week was a miserable week. Miserable things are happening in the world. I'm not going to ignore that and talk about animals, even though even though a bear crawled through the window of a house, opened the freezer, pulled out a frozen lasagna, and then crawled back out the window of a house last week. Even though that happened, which I'd love to talk about, I'm not going to talk about it. I don't and think it's that's how video. you not talk about things. It's all it's all on video. No, I'm not talking about that. I just and I didn't even bring it up. I don't know why you guys think I brought it up, but I didn't bring it okay. up. Okay. Okay. We uh, we recorded a week ago on Monday, and we knew, you know, we knew what we knew a week ago about the Israeli Palestinian conflict, the uh, the Gaza, everything. Uh, a week later, we know a lot more, and none of it is good. I don't think anything we've learned points in any direction except oh, that was worse than we originally thought you know more people died more kids died more atrocities were committed and now more palestinians are dying at a very rapid rate you know that will very quickly surpass the number of israelis who've died and there's no easy way out there's no way for either side to you know kind of back up um, and it's going to get worse before it gets better. And we're sending carrier groups to the uh, Mediterranean to try to keep uh, Iran from doing anything. So this is not good. It is really, really not good what's going on right now. Yeah, I think some people, especially younger people who haven't been paying attention to this conflict over the last 50 years or last 80 years, this is their first real introduction to the intractability of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Yeah. And you see these atrocities, you go, this is wrong and evil, there must be a solution, and apparently nobody has a thought, thought of one yet. Mm-hmm. And so some young people, frankly, are saying some stupid things right now about what's going on, and if they would just slow down and study this for 30 minutes, honestly, 30 minutes of reading on the internet will make your head spin at how complicated and messy this history is yeah and and will slow you down from making strong declarations of i know who's at fault Mm -hmm. and i know how to solve it Mm -hmm. yeah yeah it is it is 
really difficult. So I, I uh, reached out to you guys to say, bring your thoughts, because I want to give each of you a chance to discuss this from, from what you've been thinking over the last week. I'll go first so that you can have more time to react or respond or whatever. Here's what, other than just the tragedy, now that humanitarian tragedy that's happening, on top of the uh, the horrific um, atrocities that were committed a week ago in Israel. Um, I've been watching the responses around the world and uh, noticing something that there's a, there is, you know, older people, older Americans and Europeans look at Jewish people as a historically oppressed minority and that the founding of Israel was an act of justice. Uh, the younger generation of activists, many younger Americans and Europeans, look at Israel as a modern example of European colonialism, that the, Israel, the Israelis are oppressors, and that the founding of Israel was an act of injustice. And so I, I'm you know, kind of watching this play out in various demonstrations, ver demonstrations pro, ver demonstrations against, demonstrations in some cases even supporting Hamas and saying, you know, what they're doing is justified because of, because of is because Israel's the oppressor. And, you know, you can't play fair. You can't play by the rules when you're the little guy and you're the oppressed. And, you know, a couple of things I'm, I'm noticing, uh, you know, I've heard, there's an article in the Atlantic that I haven't had a chance to write to read yet. I, I just started reading it. Um, critical of how some young activists are misapplying social justice to this story. This is the Atlantic mm -hmm. saying we believe they're misapplying social justice um, to this story because it's this isn't the same. This is not the same as you know the plight of the African Americans in in the U.S. through Jim Crow and, and slavery. Um, but I also think it's interesting as we see more and more young activists justifying violence mm -hmm. that we're seeing progressive activism move further and further away from Christian ethics. You know, that the Christian ethics of MLK, the Christian ethics of many of the activists of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the, the suffragettes and um, all sorts of movements that have happened between, you know, 1820 and 1920, or, and then especially the civil rights movement that had, you know, that held up Jesus as a model for their activism um, have now largely or are largely being rejected by a new generation of activists who don't want the Christian ethic involved in their activism. And, and you see it also on the conservative side among activists, and it's most disturbing among Christian activists on the conservative mm -hmm. side who say violence may be necessary mm -hmm. in our country if we want to get our country back. So I'm, I'm concerned at the, um, the discarding of you know, the way of Jesus from activism, both among Christians and among the progressives that were Christians, you know, typically a hundred years ago, particularly in the Afro American community, were were Christians, you know, seventy years ago. And, you know, as we talked, I interviewed Charlie Dates a couple years ago talking about 2020 and the marches. And, you know, as an African American pastor in Chicago, his disappointment that some of the marches that he and other black pastors tried to participate in, the younger activists didn't want them at the front of the march. You know, like you're, you're, you're old, you're a pastor, you're, you're related to the church, your time has gone. You know, your time, you had a window and now we're taking over and we're not that interested in having pastors um, at the front of our marches. And so you kind of see that, you know, around the world now where there just there isn't the the spirit of of Christian love in our activism. And, it, and it's getting uglier and uglier and has more and more potential uh, for violence. Uh, and there's been violence among Christians involved in politics and, and activism, you know, always. Mm -hmm. um, but there was that, you know, even even among um missionaries that would historically, you know, when they weren't state-sponsored missionaries, would stand up for the people they were trying to reach against 
colonial powers, you know, and that was one of the marks of non-state sponsored Protestant missionaries is that they were activists on behalf of indigenous peoples against their own sending nations in, in many cases and, and did great benefit for those people. And that sense of selfless, nonviolent activism, I just, it seems like everyone's getting sick of it and we, we don't believe in it anymore. Guys, I think part of what you're describing, um, Jonathan Height, Height, Height. I always get this. Yeah, backwards. I think it's Height. <laughs> what is I it? I think it's Height. Is it Height? I think it's Height. H a i d t. Anyway, uh, social psychologist. He was tweeting about some of this over the past week, and I found some of what he said helpful. In his book, The Coddling of the American Mind, he they list a bunch of um, what they call great untruths that this generation is is buying into. And great untruth number three is, this is a quote, life is a battle between good people and evil people. Mm. And he said that this mindset that you can categorize everybody as, you know, a white hat or a black hat, they're entirely good or they're entirely evil. He said this leads otherwise good people to celebrate war crimes. Mm -hmm. So maybe you think the Israelis are the white hat and the Palestinians are the black hat, then the Israeli government and military can do nothing wrong mm -hmm. in retaliation mm -hmm. for this for this strike on the flip side if you think the palestinians are the oppressed and the, the white hats here then they can do nothing wrong in the way they try to express their anger at their oppression including you know the murder of innocent civilians and kidnapping and children and stuff like that which is just incredibly stupid to argue that people are just all good or all bad and you have to claim a whole side. There's no nuance in that, but mm -hmm. that's that mm -hmm. is, leads to the kind of stuff you're talking about, Phil, where people, you know, the, 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 the important thing that the Christian tradition brings to activism, that the civil rights movement did so brilliantly, and people like Martin Luther King and so many others, is there was an acknowledgement of the evil of, of whatever it is that they were objecting to. In the case of the civil rights movement, it was white supremacy and Jim Crow and all those injustices. It was evil, and they could call it evil. But there was also an awareness that we are capable of evil as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it, if we don't follow the, the, the guidance of Christ and loving our enemies, we can so quickly fall into that same depravity as the thing we are fighting. So we must be above reproach. We need to take the higher road. We need to follow the way of Jesus. Otherwise, we become the very thing that we're trying to fight against. But when you take the ethic of Christ out of these things, then it so easily becomes just fight fire with fire. Yeah. Evil for evil, eye for eye, as Gandhi said, an eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind. Mm -hmm. And that feels a lot like what we're in right now. People are just taking their sides and justifying their favored community's actions without boundary or limitation. Because you can do nothing evil in response to evil is the mindset. And that's just completely antithetical to the way of Jesus. Yeah, it does, it does seem that the religious impulse you know, kind of the naked religious impulse, which is to speak of things in terms of good and evil and sin and judgment um, without, you know, the, the redemptive and forgiving uh, that actually goes against the religious impulse. It is not the religious impulse to forgive your enemy. It's the religious impulse to declare them a sinner and call on judgment. And that's, you know, you see, We've always seen that in, in fundamentalist circles, fundamentalist Islam, uh, you know, or even fundamentalist Hinduism in, in India, where the clashes are between the, the Hindu majority and the, and the uh, Muslim minority. But that, that kind of raw uh, religious impulse to declare heretics and try to, you know, expunge the evil from the camp and, but now we're seeing that in in uh, progressive secular circles, you know, that religious mm -hmm. impulse, the, the good, the bad, the sinful, the, you know, in need of judgment. And so we're seeing these, you know, kids rising up around the world acting, you know, in European countries from European backgrounds acting like fundamentalist Islamists or fundamentalist, you know, the, the worst parts of fundamentalist Christianity. Um, coming from a secular background, Caitlin, you're these are your your kinfolk, not your kinfolk. It's your generation. Your people. What do you see? You grew up. <laughs> Defend them. Yeah, no, don't def just just well, what what have you seen from you yeah. know your life growing up with this generation? 
First, I just have to say, in response to what both of you have said, I also think it's important to say that there's both not only the way of Jesus for Christians to turn to, but a robust just war tradition that like has had mm-hmm. differences and disputes throughout our history, but has given us rich theological resources for not just individuals wondering how they respond to instances of wrong, but how nations do and how organizations and groups of people do. And there's egregious violations of at least you know, significant strands of the just war tradition on both sides of this conflict. And so we're not without resources for thinking of that, which Mm -hmm. is also included in the conflicts that have happened. I'm thinking, especially because you brought up the civil rights movement among black theorists and theologians throughout American history, some of whom advocated for not quite the like completely nonviolent approach, but there were still Mm -hmm. differences there. Like it wasn't just indiscriminate killing of, of non-combatants, you know, in the sense of, of, of civil conflicts. So there's a, a whole range of responses that we could have that are not just complete pacifism, but still provide a robust response to what has been unjust and wrong in this conflict coming from both sides, truly. In terms of the young people thing, I, I don't know as much of what I could say about like young people in general, but I'm especially thinking of young evangelicals or ex-evangelicals who grew up in the church, especially the kinds of churches that I grew up in, dispensationalist churches, that had a really high view of of the current nation of Israel and and took biblical you know commands to treat Israel well that you are blessed if you treat Israel well and you're cursed if you do not very literally when it came to the US and the nation of Israel today and I have seen some of those folks, pastors and, and other people, responding in ways that really concern me to this, of Israel can do no wrong. And and look, this fits into biblical descriptions of people that it doesn't really line up that directly. But what I've seen in a lot of the folks, from a lot of the folks that grew up in the circles with me is that maybe we discarded that dispensational theology. Maybe we discarded that way of thinking about Israel. We did not discard the posture of, it is easy for me to discern who is the good guy and the bad guy, like Sky said. Mm-hmm. And I, even though I am quite distanced from this conflict, feel like I need to prove I'm on the right team of this and will treat it as like existentially important for my community here and now, even though I have very little ability to make much difference in this conflict in another part of the world. So I've seen some people that that concerns me, where it's like, well, if I was told growing up that it's clear who's right in any conflict, it's Israel. And then at some point I realized like the great damage that's been done to Palestinians and realize some of them are Christians. And I feel Mm -hmm. like I have a Christian Mm -hmm. responsibility to care for them. It's easy to just change the external details and not the posture. Mm. And I understand that. I mean, I remember being in seminary at a dispensationalist seminary in one of my spiritual formation groups a few years in when I had started questioning some elements of dispensationalism. I wasn't really sure what I believed. And there was a Palestinian Christian in my spiritual formation group who, because of a variety of circumstances, had chosen to be at this school, but obviously deeply disagreed with the way we talked about Israel. And listening to her week after week talk about that and her family's experience of being, I mean, she had come from Jordan. She had been, her family had been pushed out of their home and she had this real experience of what that looked like in her family generationally. It did really change how I felt about all of this, but I'm thankful that I wasn't going through those questions in this heated time and online where I couldn't just ask some different questions about how we had been interpreting scripture, what this conflict meant, who was involved, and, and and honestly really lament my own past ignorance of people made in God's image who had been really harmed in this conflict, I couldn't safely do that if I was figuring that out now on the internet because the pressure is be on right. the right side, pick mm-hmm. the right team, and be militant in how you describe your position. I had the benefit of having a bunch of compassionate professors to ask questions to and to think about how the theology yeah. I grew up with intersected with this conflict and who was involved, and and there's no room for that right now. And so I I feel like there's also an important word for a lot of young people to just say, hey, how you're feeling now of this like pressure to fit into a certain team and say the right thing and be on the right side, even though you are not intimately a part of this conflict at all. Remember that feeling if you feel frustrated by it and start to apply that to some other scenarios too, because this keeps Mm -hmm. happening and it, it really does not only harm the people that maybe you feel like now are your enemy in your church because they disagree with you, but I also just think it doesn't give you the space to ask good questions and read things and figure stuff out. And and that's going to serve you poorly for like the rest of your development as you ask some of these big questions that you're going to continue to ask about theology and politics. Caitlin, if I can piggyback off of that, I think one of the things I've been observing 
at least online, I haven't interacted in person with as many people about this. But one thing I've, I think people are confusing or conflating explanation with justification. Hmm. And what yeah. I what I mean by that is some people I think are afraid to to study, ask questions, and learn about why is Israel behaving the way it's behaving, or why are Palestinians, yeah. or particularly Hamas, why are they doing these horrible things that they're doing? Because they fear, well, if I seek understanding or explanation, I will in some way be justifying mm-hmm. what they've done. And no one wants to be seen as an apologist for the wrong side. Right. But explanation is not justification. Like I, I feel like I have read over the years quite a bit on this conflict. When I was in seminary 25 years ago, I was in one course where I had, there was a Palestinian Christian who sat on one side of me, and there was a Messianic Jew who sat on the other wow. side of me. And the three of us had fascinating conversations mm. about all of this. But learning about and and understanding and even seeking some sense of an explanation for why things are happening the way they are happening in no way justifies what's happening. So when you study the plight of the Palestinians, particularly in Gaza, over the last 15 to 20 years, it helps me understand why these Hamas terrorists did what they did. It gives zero justification for what they did. And I think people are fearful of of explaining anything because they're going to be interpreted as justifying what they did. And that's, or the flip for the Israeli Mm -hmm. side. Like Mm -hmm. I, I can explain why Israel is doing what they're doing to Gaza right now. That doesn't mean I'm justifying all of it, but we got to separate those two things if we're ever going to have meaningful conversation and learn what's really happening. Okay. Caitlin, what did activism look like? on the campus of Liberty University, and what does activism look like on the campus of Duke, and in what ways are they the same, and in what ways are they different? That's a wonderful question, Phil. Thank um, you. They, they do feel pretty remarkably similar. I mean, I remember in the, like, the last two years I was at Liberty was the lead up to the 2016 election. We had a lot of politicians on campus. I remember when Bernie Sanders came, and there was a lot of students protesting you know, his beliefs about abortion, but also just like he's a socialist and all this Mm -hmm. stuff, really negative feelings towards him. And I think one of the most like profound experiences of my time there was sitting in this giant stadium with all these students, Bernie Sanders is talking and to his credit, like really tried to just like, you know, find some common ground with us. And the way he started was I care about caring for the poor. And Christians have a strong historical record of caring for the poor. We might have differences of opinion about how to do that, but could we start there and talk about that? And I remember the person interviewing him being like, no, abortion. Like, it just was like, there was no, no, you know, kind of entertaining this question. Mm -hmm. But I also remember sitting, and you can feel the room, and I'm looking around at my peers. And while he's saying that, again, at that point, I was not going to vote for Bernie Sanders. I thought he seemed like a nice person. I didn't have really strong feelings about him. I knew I wasn't going to vote for him. But in that moment, I was really captivated. But like you came here to a place that you knew would hate you and you tried to find some common ground. So I was really interested. And I remember as he's saying that, looking around and seeing all of these crossed arms, intense negative feeling towards him because he's on the wrong side of this. He's not on our team. And so it's just important for us to prove that he's the bad guy and we're the good guys. I often experience that. I mean, I haven't been around a lot of like campus activism and like serious kind of protesting way at Duke. But among a lot of the students that I talk to both in the Divinity School, but very often more likely outside the Divinity School, it is similar in the sense that we all know already what the right side is to be on in any conflict. Like there's really not a discussion about it most of the time. I haven't really been around hearing any discussions about this particular conflict in in Israel and Gaza at all. But I wouldn't be surprised if it was similar of like, there's just, there's really not a lot to say here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We all know what it looks like to be on the right side. And so it's not hard to kind of voice your support for it. Is that because we, we just select our peer groups more ideologically now, or that, that social media helps us? you know, kind of dig dig yeah. a rut and then stick to our rut with the other people that agree with us? Yeah, and I do just think, I mean, I understand why disagreement is so uncomfortable, mm-hmm. but I don't think a lot of my peers or myself, and this is not the problem of, you know, 
liberal elite colleges. This is the problem of our churches and our families and our communities. We have not been practiced well in having disagreements with one another. It is scary to like mm -hmm. to wonder if you will really be ostracized by your group of friends for an opinion that doesn't match theirs, especially on issues that are not silly things. They are really important questions of of violence and community and the ultimate meaning of life and what, you know, all of those are are scary things to be on the other side of your peers with. Right. And we have, I think, generally speaking, and this is not like a wagging my finger at millennials, because again, like this is partially our parents' fault, is like we just were not in contexts where we learned how to have disagreements well and learned that there was safety in disagreeing. I, I really honestly think one of the greatest gifts my parents gave me is that we fought a bunch when I was in high school and college as I was changing my mind about everything theologically and politically and working out all this stuff. I never once even momentarily considered that they would not love me or take care of me or like me because of the disagreements that we had. And I fear that the context that so many of us have been in, whether that's a family or a church, I mean, or a school, any of those kinds of contexts have not had that really grounding experience of some people will still love you even if you are really in deep disagreement with them. And so of course, when you go out to school and you realize you have a disagreement with your peers, who would blame you for just being like, no, we're all going to make sure we're on the same. I'm going to self-select or I'm going to stay quiet about the things I disagree with. Because, mm -hmm. of course, you want to keep the community that is really crucial to just human flourishing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, for a generation that one of their anthems is silence is violence, the, <laughs> the idea of not being silent and actively voicing your disagreement is even worse, right? right? So, like, the, we have so inflated disagreement as a form of trauma and 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 aggressive violence that we are not training people in how to disagree well at all and we which don't, makes sense then why why they would isolate into homogenous groups and we don't have experience like that's one of the things that's been really frustrating to me about a lot of the internet fighting about this is coming from a bunch of people in myself included obviously who have no experience with what a war actually looks like, with that level of violence mm -hmm. and carnage. Like we don't have that. So for us to pretend like we are as deeply invested in this is just wrong. Like we don't have experience. I mean, I, I was listening today to a New York Times podcast where they were interviewing um, someone who lives in Hamas, a Palestinian who was talking about the conflict. And the whole time he was talking, I just kept thinking like, if you are there, if you are in a war zone, experiencing what you're experiencing, there's no way you talk the way Americans are talking on Twitter about this because you recognize right. that this is just like people being killed or kidnapped or maimed and that's not a reality that you can fight about the way we've been fighting about things. Mm. Okay, so before we move on, because I have one other thing I want to talk about. Um, what's your advice for someone? I'm a listener. I listen to you guys. I like you guys. How can I think about this better? Like what's one piece of advice each of you would give for someone who's struggling to think about this and whether or not to respond to their friends or family members about it? Uh, I'll, I'll go first. Two things come to mind. Number one, I'm sure many of the people who are Holy Post fans and listen to this show regularly are really smart, thoughtful, intelligent, All of probably them. deeply in, in influential mm -hmm. in their various <laughs> roles in this world. Mm -hmm. However, I don't think anyone is desperately waiting to hear what you think about the Israeli-Palestinian <laughs> conflict and how to solve it. Frankly, no one's really interested in what I have to say about it or Phil or Caitlin. Like, we are not shaping this thing. like it's we are not that important you are not that important so, and, and all that to say like the first thing you should do is just stay silent just be quiet and listen but sky and what si silence is violence i know that's the hard part is no one lets you be silent anymore but very closely related to that is once you shut up and you're silent for a little bit and you're listening you're in a posture of learning mm-hmm mm -hmm. And I, if you had given me this question before we were recording, Phil, I may have been able to come up with a resource. But I think, like I said at the beginning, a lot of people just don't know the history, the really complicated history of Zionism and post-World War II and, you know, the recovery from the Holocaust and, and the decision to have a Jewish state in the Middle East and, you know, all this stuff. And then the formation of a Palestinian, Palestinian identity, which really didn't exist before the creation of Israel and all, you know, it's such a complicated, messy, messy history. And 
I think this is an opportunity for people who do care about what's happening to educate themselves, read up on it, mm -hmm. study it a little bit. And I, I'm fairly confident that anyone who does that is not going to come out of that process going, oh, I've got a clear black and white view now of what the problem is and who's right and who's wrong. Um, you can come out of it with a clear black and white vision of what's good and evil or what should be allowed and what should not be allowed, like kidnapping civilians and murdering children and, and targeting of civilians mm -hmm. from either side is wrong. But it doesn't mean that the political conflict and the, the solution is clearly obvious. So that all brings humility. And I would encourage people to take this opportunity to do that and study it. Okay, we'll study, and maybe you'll come up with a resource that we could put in the show notes before this comes out mm, on Wednesday. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Caitlin, what's your advice? Help us, I, Caitlin. I would also say two things. One is be clear with yourself about what a goal, what goals you have for a conversation with other people. Um, if you are talking about this with people in your church or your family or your neighborhood, um, is the goal that you convince them of your position or whatever position you think you've kind of come to. Um, but as Sky said, is the goal listening and understanding, but also again, having a realistic view of like what your role in this is. You mm -hmm. have almost nothing to do that will actually affect this conflict. This could be a valuable opportunity to both learn more about vulnerable people around the world to support humanitarian organizations that can do things about this kind of stuff that isn't a policy that the US might do that, that you really have very little control over. But then also really thinking, like, what does a conversation about this mean for my community? Is it that we in my church have a conversation about how we think about people who are religiously different from us, how we think about Israel and how Israel is described in scripture versus the nation of Israel today? Are there theological conversations that we should have? Are there policy conversations we should have? But being clear about what the goal is will help you because it's so easy in a conversation like this to just feel defensive, feel like you dig your heels further and further into the position that maybe originally you were just sort of tentatively holding, but they make a bad argument you know, mm -hmm. for the other side. And it's like, no, now I'm in the fight and watching that and trying to prevent yourself from putting yourself in that kind of situation. The second thing I would say is last week I was talking about how I was teaching in, in Revelation um, 8 and 9 about, about the prayers of God's people going to the throne room of God and being heard. And the part that I didn't say that I, you know, learned as I kept studying to teach it is that it's really interesting that it says in the, in those couple of chapters that the prayers are added, um, incense is added to the prayers and fire, purifying agents. And then after those purifying agents are added, then the prayers return as, as judgment on earth, which I think is a really comforting thing for me to go. If it's true, that prayer is one of the most powerful responses that I have to conflict in the world, especially things that I have so little ability to do anything materially about. But also, I can pray freely. I can pray asking for things that maybe are the wrong things to ask, but it's the best that I know to ask. I can pray for people that I think are the good guys or the bad guys. And my prayers are purified by God because they will be fallen prayers. I will not know the right thing to do. I won't know the right thing mm. to pray. And they respond not as the judgment that I would enact on people, but the judgment that God knows is right on what is truly unrighteous and and prays for what is truly righteous. And there's something comforting in that, not just that my prayers are, her, are heard, but that my judgment about things does not affect the judgment that God makes. God's judgment is right always. And I can take comfort in knowing that that will ultimately be true. Cool. It's a good answer. My my tiny contribution is to be wary of your own theology or eschatology or any other mm. uh, religiously motivated belief allowing you, giving you a permission structure to dehumanize other image bearers. Because mm. uh, it's so easy to, oh, I came up with something in the Bible that lets me say why African Americans are slightly less human than I am, or I became, you know, came up with something in the Bible, and here's why enemies of Israel are actually subhuman, and, you know, they deserve what they've got coming. And I just like that, there's no Jesus in that. There's just no Jesus in using my religious beliefs to declare someone else outside the circle of humanity. Okay, that's my two cents. Uh, the only thing I, I wanted to cover, I've been trying to cover for this is a third straight week. Uh, <laughs> 
David uh, French wrote a piece in the New York Times on October 1st entitled One Reason the Trump Fever Won't Break. He's talking about Christian nationalism and the rise of Christian nationalism um, and weird things like the findings of a, a poll for the, the Desiree News showing that more Republicans see Donald Trump as a person of faith than they see very religious figures like Mitt Romney, Tim Scott, and Mike Pence as people of faith. Um, and he's writing, he's talking about the difference between intellectual or philosophical Christian nationalism and then something else, which he says uh, Thomas Kidd, the church history professor at Baylor, describes as emotional Christian nationalism, which isn't really based in political thought or political theory. It's not really based in a, you know, a 400 page treatise on Christian nationalism. It's just, it's just based in a, a gut feeling and, and uh, kind of a gut anger. Um, actual Christian nationalism, Kidd argues, is more a visceral reaction than a rationally chosen stance. Essays and books about philosophy and theology are important for determining the ultimate health of the church, but they're much less important than emotion, prophecy, and spiritualism when we're talking about attitudes towards politics. Arguments about the proper role of virtue in the public square, for example, or arguments over the proper balance between order and liberty are helpless in the face of prophecies, like the declaration from Christian quote-unquote apostles that Donald Trump is God's appointed leader, destined to save the nation from destruction. Uh, there's one last element that cements this bond with Donald Trump. Uh, faith, including a burning sense of certainty that by supporting him, we are instruments of God's divine plan. Uh, and this is uh, David French's conclusion. For this reason, I've started answering questions about Christian nationalism by saying it's not serious, but it's very dangerous. It's not a serious position to argue that this diverse, secularizing country will shed liberal democracy for Catholic or Protestant religious rule. But it's exceedingly dangerous and destabilizing when millions of citizens believe that the fate of the church is bound up in the person they believe is the once and future president of the United States. So uh, he's describing there are political theory thinkers in, in Catholic circles and in conservative Christian circles that are making very long, elaborate, detailed arguments for, you know, Catholic integralism or, or theocracy or theonomy. And that's not the mass. That's, that's not the people that show up at Trump rallies. The people that show up at Trump rallies believe that Donald Trump, it, the once and future president, is in control of the fate of the church and the fate of the nation. And uh, David French's conclusion is this is why the Trump fever won't break. This is why even the most biblically based argument against Trump falls on deaf ears. That's why the very act of Christian opposition to Trump is often seen as a grave betrayal of Christ himself. You're betraying Jesus if you oppose Donald Trump. Uh, in 2024, this nation will wrestle with Christian nationalism once again, but it won't be the nationalism of ideas. It will be a nationalism rooted more in emotion and mysticism than theology. And the fever may not break until the prophecies, quote unquote, change. And that is a factor entirely out of our control. So that's his, uh, his uh, advice to the readers of the New York Times, is that this isn't about arguing rationally against Christian nationalism or even against Donald Trump. What we're up against is millions of people who, who believe that Trump is a divinely appointed you know, hammer of retribution that will save America and Christianity. What do we do about that? He doesn't offer a lot of hope. No, no. He just says the well. He says the prophecies have to change. Which yeah, but Let's get why on that. are they there? Yeah, in the why, first why would place? they? Like why? Why would they? They're a money maker. I. You know what this reminded me of is, um, Caitlin. You're not going to like this metaphor. I apologize in advance um, because it involves a toddler. Like sometimes you see. Why you would see I not a, love a, that? Hold, because uh -oh. just hold on uh -oh. like sometimes I, hopefully you you've observed say? this before no like you you're out somewhere in public and you see a little little kid a little toddler a little tot like two years old or under having an absolute meltdown of a tantrum mm -hmm. right for whatever reason yeah. doesn't matter yeah. and sometimes you will see a parent try to reason 
sit there oh, and try yeah. to reason with that little kid, giving them a rational explanation for why they shouldn't be throwing their poop around the room or something like that. Like it's just some kind of, and you're, and, and you, you, at one level I want to say, Hey, good for you for trying to do something. But on another, I'm like, you moron, you're dumber than the kid. Why would I like, not like this? <laughs> because I don't want to make it sound like children are a problem. They're not. It's just when, when you miscalculate what works, yeah. with mm-hmm. the person you're dealing with. Mm-hmm. And in a, in a way, I think what David French is saying far more articulately than I am and more um, respectfully <laughs> is there are a lot of people out there who are Trump supporters who are two-year-olds having a tantrum and the rest of the country is trying to reason with them. The rest of the church is trying to reason with them and give them explanations, arguments, theologies, all that, why their trust in Trump is misplaced, whether they're Christian or whatever, and and it's not going to work mm-hmm. because fundamentally they're not engaging with him for a rational reason. And that's what the hucksters who are selling them all this prophecy stuff understand. They're the ones giving toddlers candy and making tons of money, and the rest of us are going, no, you shouldn't eat that much candy, Johnny, because it's going to make your tummy hurt and it's going to give you it's going to give you cavities mm-hmm. and it's going to make you a type 2 diabetic by the time you're 14, blah, blah, blah. And you're really going to po- be... toddler's like, give me my candy back. You're really going to be nuts when it comes time to vote. So we right. take the candy away. Caitlin, mm-hmm. help us out. You are, you are on a mission to help the church think about politics. This is true. So... It's time. The bat signal. <laughs> I'm lighting the bat signal. I Sky was right actually. I don't like his analogy. <laughs> I I'm very aware of the like failure to reason with a tantruming two year old. Mm-hmm. Um, but and I understand why you make that connection. My concern is, and this is my concern with the David French article, which I really agree with. I do think we have paid way too much attention to the handful of books and kind of intellectuals talking about this rather than what's what emotions and stories are Mm -hmm. motivating what's happening. I totally agree. What I don't want anyone to hear in your analogy that I don't think you mean is kind of a paternalistic response to their friends and family of just like, oh, you sad child. You don't understand what's going on. Because one of the differences between the toddler who doesn't understand the candy thing and the adult who has been swept up into the emotions and the stories of Christian nationalism, of kind of Trumpist conservatism, et cetera, One of the differences is the emotions and the stories that are captivating them are on a whole other level Mm -hmm. than the stories and emotions that a two-year-old is experiencing. Totally. Um, because but their brains it feels more the same to the two-year-old. It feels. It does. I'm sure it does feel the, the same. I'm sure it's, it does feel the same. It's targeting the same part of our being. It's 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 the emotional appetite yes. kind of center rather than the rational. It's, it's the lizard brain side. Right. It, it, well, to well, use Jonathan Haidt again, it's the elephant rather than the rider. He talks about our emotions are the elephant that drives us, and the rider on the elephant is our reason. But the rider doesn't have the elephant's going to do what the elephant's going to do, mm. and that's true of everybody. I'm not Caitlin, saying it's only Trump people; Caitlin, it's all of us. Tell him where he's wrong. Go the the thing I don't him. love about that, which is not just an, like disagreeing with Sky, but the thing I don't love about the Jonathan Haidt stuff either, is I think it it tends to play into a pretty modern idea about who should be running the ship and its reason. And ultimately, Mm -hmm. if we were just rational, we would make the right decisions and things would be fine. Again, one of the differences between the toddler, and actually this can be true of toddlers too, actually. I mean, I'm not a parent, but I've heard lots of parents say similar things like this. There are very legitimate emotions and stories at Mm -hmm. play in a lot of this. And so I both don't want us to devalue those and say, well, who should be running the show here is is the reason. Um, And I don't want us to think that what they're doing is just being annoyed they can't have candy. When really, I mean, part of what is so powerful about this is that some of the emotions and the stories that are at play are true. People are responding to their sense that the world has rapidly mm-hmm. changed, that their family is is kind of disintegrating, that the way that they understood marriage or sexuality feels like it's rapidly changed and kind of the rug has been pulled out from under their feet. A lot of the things that are happening internationally that feel scary, their sense that patriotism is declining. And I thought we were all on the same team about our country and its goodness. And I felt like I knew what my place was in the world. And it's not, we shouldn't respond to those with either, oh yeah, that's exactly how you should feel and those are the stories you should believe, but we shouldn't respond either with, those are such ridiculous feelings and stories to believe. 
I think what would be better, rather than either reasoning with someone and saying, well, if I just explain to you the truth of things, if I throw some numbers and data at you, you understand what's wrong, or kind of coddling them and saying, oh, no, those are great stories and emotions to believe, but is to get into the emotions and the stories and ask some good questions about what parts of those are good and true. There's always, this is like what we were, were just talking about the last story of like, it's not so easily discernible. These are the good guys and these are the bad guys. The people who are captivated by these stories and emotions, there are some good stories and good emotions at play in this. And I think the challenging thing, and this is, again, the article doesn't give a lot of like positive responses to this. The challenging thing is for like, pastors and Bible study leaders and people and families to do the really long, hard work of of talking through those stories and emotions with people in their contexts mm -hmm. and, and working through how to both recognize that the gospel is an answer to some of those anxieties and fears that have been nurtured in them by malevolent actors and to nurture the positive parts of those stories. Like the fact that you, for example, if someone is really freaking out about crime and they're like, we need a strong president to kind of, you know, tamp down all the crime in our country. There's some like racism playing into that. There's some really bad assumptions about immigrants. There's some Go, go into that. Ask some questions about where they learned that and what's so animating about that and why they're so concerned about that. And maybe you find out that their next door neighbor was mugged and they're freaked out about that. And then there's like a whole other pastoral response to that that is important, just as is important as talking through the racism and the anti-immigration stuff that's in there that should not be ignored, should totally be dealt with. But instead of recognizing that there may be just an, instead of saying that there's just an evil person there, they're just racist, they're just xenophobic, let's just ignore yeah. them, is to instead say, that stuff needs to be repented of, we need to have conversations about that stuff, and also, there's some other stuff going on in you that is a legitimate response to, to hurt in your life or your community that needs to be given a more pastoral response. All right, Caitlin, now it's my chance to disagree with you. Okay, do mm. it. Oh, this because is fun. I, I, your diagnosis, I think, is absolutely correct. Like the, 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 the emotional response some people have to Trump and all these other issues are legitimate emotional responses. I'm not saying that they're behaving like two year olds, but all the, the engagement you just talked about all relies on reason. It's all, well, we should sit down and have a conversation about why it is you have such strong feelings about crime or immigration or, and you are trying to help them overcome that emotional source with a reasonable response you're saying no that. i don't think so why not we can, you don't well, think so you don't think reason, having a rational conversation about the origins of your fears is not relying on reason Reason it plays a part in that conversation absolutely but if part of what yeah. you're doing is responding to this fear that you have with a story of what is actually true in the world is not just reason it's not just rationality it's those are involved absolutely my concern with the jonathan Haidt stuff is not that reason shouldn't play a part in this. It absolutely should. And you can't really have any conversation using words where you're not employing some element of I reason. Agree. My issue yeah. is in elevating that above emotion as if a deeply emotional response to the pain of the world is not a deeply Christian response that can address some of the irrational fear that people have of yeah. certain things in their communities. I don't think I don't think Jonathan Haidt is saying that the writer the reason should control the elephant. His, the whole point of his metaphor is reason never can control the elephant. I think it's the just that that's what people in people interpret that as. That's what I want. The goal is to right. get reason no, no, no. to drive he, the train. His, he's saying that's a stupid goal because it's impossible. Yes, it is. It's not possible. Like all of us are driven by, and like when I was a pastor, we used to have this saying among the pastoral team when we were dealing, dealing with different crises and relationships in the church or whatever. Uh, the, the mind justifies the decisions of the heart. Meaning people make up their yeah. their decision and then they give you the rationale for why they're justifying doing it. That's the the elephants made the decision and then the rider goes, Well, that's what I wanted anyway. Yeah. So I agree with you. The question like if people if their elephant, if their emotion is drawn to these destructive things, whether it's Trumpism or Christian nationalism, whatever it is, the solution can't be reason. Yeah. The solution has to be how do I get the elephant to be attracted to something else that's healthier? Mm -hmm that's less destructive. Yeah. That's, so how do you appeal to people's emotions in an alternative direction? And to go back to, to David French's thing, he's saying people are being tapped in with all this uh, eschatology and prophecy and all this Christian nationalism emotion, and it's directing the elephant towards really dangerous stuff. Mm -hmm. The only way to get the elephant to go somewhere else is with a different yeah. story. Yes. A different, but you, I'm, 
I'm not seeing that. I don't see anyone offering that. Have you seen the video circulating online of the guy who takes an upright piano out into an elephant preserve and plays the piano for elephants? And there's some elephants that live on this. It's like a, a recovery place for elephants, for traumatized elephants that, you know, were in some were being mistreated. And the elephants will just stand around the piano with their eyes closed and listen. So that's what we need to do. We need to play music. <laughs> We need to play music for our elephant emotions yeah, to yes. calm them down and point them to something higher. Beauty, beauty. It's not just rational. Yeah. There's emotion, but it's positive. It draws you into something better. Okay, we really need to wrap it up now. We went a little bit long, but it was a good conversation. Thank you, Sky. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, everybody out there. We just love you guys, and you support us with, on uh, Holy Post Plus. Go check out the newest stuff where Caitlin schools uh, Sky about Taylor Swift. I went and saw the Taylor Swift movie, by the way, but we don't have time to talk about it right Did now. Did you? Yeah, I was invited to go. We were invited oh, to actually, go. Oh, actually, I heard about this. Yeah. You did? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yep. It was it was interesting. It was, <laughs> it, it was it was long and it was loud. Like it was like concert volume. In oh my theater. gosh, Phil, don't sound so old. <laughs> I know. I know. I can't help it. Okay, everybody. Are you, are you a Swifty now, Phil? Ah, we can talk about that next week. I don't have time <laughs> Ooh, to go. That's a, that's a dodge. That's a dodge. I don't have time to go into it now because I have to listen to what you said. Then, then I'll say, oh, yeah. I get it yeah, now. Yeah, you better or we'll cancel now you. Now I get it now. Oh, she's the next prophet that I've been waiting for. <laughs> she's the chosen one to direct my elephant in the right healthy direction. Okay. <laughs> But I'm just going to shake it off in the meantime. And <laughs> I will see you guys next week. Goodbye. This episode is sponsored by Moody Publishers, who have a new book from our buddy, Drew Dick. We love Drew Dick. Who doesn't love Drew Dick? He's thoughtful. He's funny. He's Canadian. He's a regular guest on The Holy Post and the author of the new book, Just Show Up. A Guide for Exhausted Christians. Growing up in the evangelical church, I heard the message over and over that God had big, amazing things in mind for me to do. Our culture tells us we're brilliant and awesome and powerful and capable of anything. Yet most of us, me included, feel like the best we can do half the time is just get ourselves out of bed and show up at work with matching socks. Thankfully, God doesn't expect us to do everything. Simply showing up is often the most important thing. With his signature humor and candor, Drew writes about his own messy life while telling inspiring stories of how God rewards the persistent presence of ordinary people, just like you and me. Pick up your copy of Just Show Up today at moodypublishers.com or wherever you buy books. And thanks to Moody Publishers for sponsoring this episode. This episode of The Holy Post is sponsored by Haya Health. Hey, do you have kids? Do you care about their health? Of course you do. Most kids' vitamins are basically candy in disguise, filled with two teaspoons of sugar, unhealthy chemicals, and other gummy junk kids really shouldn't be eating. That's why Haya was created, the pediatrician-approved, super-powered, chewable vitamin for kids. Zero sugar, zero gummy junk, yet they taste great and are perfect for picky eaters. Haya fills in the most common gaps in modern children's diet to provide the full body nourishment our kids need with a yummy taste they love. And we've worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. Receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, you need to go to HayaHealth.com slash Holy Post. This deal is not available on their regular website. Go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H dot com slash Holy Post and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into health. The adults. And thanks to Haya Health for sponsoring this episode. N.T. Wright hardly needs an introduction. He's one of the most famous and influential New Testament scholars in the world. He has shaped an entire generation of pastors, teachers, and Bible readers, including me. And his new book is called Into the Heart of Romans, and it's a deep dive into Romans chapter 8. Wright says that we've allowed too much Western, medieval, European theology to warp the way we read Paul's words, rather than understanding them in their first century Jewish and Roman context. That leads to a totally different understanding of what Paul actually meant by being conformed to the image of the Son, sharing in his glorification, and even what it means for the Spirit to be groaning within us. He says that the most famous verse in this chapter, 
verse 28, which many Christians take as a promise that God will make all things work together for our good, may actually be a bad interpretation. Yeah, this is going to be an eye-opening conversation and it's a very eye-opening book. But I've got even more for you because I've recorded a bonus conversation with Glenn Packiam to go even deeper into Tom Wright's understanding of Romans 8, and it's exclusively for Holy Post Plus subscribers. Glenn is an author, a pastor, and a Holy Post pundit. In our conversation together, we unpack the practical implications of all of this for Christians, including our understanding of mission, vocation, power, and even what worship should look like in the local church. So you don't want to miss that bonus content this week, I promise. For those of you who don't know, N.T. Wright is the former Bishop of Durham, he's the author of more books than I have brain cells, and he's currently the Senior Research Fellow at Wycliffe Hall, Oxford University. Here is my conversation with Tom Wright. Tom Wright, welcome back to The Holy Post. Thank you. It's good to be with you. So I'm delighted to have read your new book, Into the Heart of Romans, a deep dive mm -hmm. into Paul's greatest letter. I'll admit, when I first received the advanced reader copy of the book, I thought it was going to be about the entire letter of Paul to the Romans. And then I actually got my nose into the book and realized, oh, this entire book is on one chapter of Romans. It's just chapter eight. Um, why, why is chapter eight so central? I mean, it's literally central to the letter, but why is it so central to understanding Paul's letter and enti the entire gospel, for that matter. Why? Why this yeah. one chapter? That's a good question. It's a good question. I mean, as I've pondered Romans over the years, and as you probably know, I did my doctoral dissertation on Romans a very long time ago. So this was really the door in which I entered the whole field of New Testament studies. Um, over the years, I've become more aware that Romans is significantly different from Paul's other letters in that it seems to be a carefully planned exposition in... Uh, I, I'm a musician by background, and I think I see it as a symphony in four movements, chapters 1 to 4, 5 to 8, 9 to 11, 12 through 16. And uh, you can see that though those sections are quite different from one another, there is a very clever and subtle and, and, and uh, dense... Um, flow going through the letter so that, as you say, when you get to the halfway point, which is the end of chapter eight, um, there's a sense that we've built up to a great climax here. Everything that he's been saying so far is here. And then what then happens in 9 to 11 and 12 to 16 flows from the, the pinnacle, the peak that he has then reached. And so I, I have in mind that Paul had, had been mulling this over for a long time. You know, people sometimes talk as if Paul just kind of dashed his letters off um, you know, he was dictating uh, at random almost and said the first thing that came to his head, um, freewheeling. I don't think that's so of Romans at all. I think it's a very carefully structured piece of writing. And so when you get Romans 8 um, very much at the center of this careful structure, I think Paul has deliberately allowed several themes to come rushing together here. And that's that's why we get in a very short compass um, a treatment of uh, Christology, of the Holy Spirit, of the atonement, uh, especially of the resurrection, of the Christian vocation in the world, of the call to suffering, of the cosmic vision, and, and so on. And then this amazing paean at the end, um, addressed, I think, to uh, Roman Christians who Paul knew were either suffering at the moment or were highly likely to be very soon. So all of that in 39 verses is a quite extraordinary achievement. Um, for me, I would happily have gone through the whole letter, but as you see, if it takes how many <laughs> pages it is, um, uh, a couple of hundred for one chapter, well, if I had done the whole letter, that might have been um, quite a long book. And... <laughs> And I've written one or two long books already, and I wasn't about to do another one just at the moment. Yeah, I have many of them on my shelf. Uh, speaking of books, right. the, 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 my most recent book is much, much shorter, and it includes little drawings, but it's basically a look at how we've misunderstood the concept of heaven, or the ah. heavens, the kingdom of heaven, all of that, which I'm deeply indebted to your scholarship on. But that, that's a theme that comes up frequently in this book about Romans 8, that when we bring our, our Western theological framework into reading Paul, and we bring questions about heaven into Romans 8 in particular, it completely uh, warps our interpretation of what he is saying. Um, so yeah, talk yeah. a little bit about how, first of all, you mentioned that heaven's never mentioned in this chapter, and it's never really mentioned in, in the form of uh, going 
to be with God after we die. It's never mentioned anywhere in Romans at all. And yet, many scholars, many theologians look at Romans as Paul's, you know, great opus of the gospel. But if his gospel doesn't speak about going to be in heaven when we die, why have we gotten Paul's understanding so wrong? And, and Oh, what a great question. And in fact, over the last decade or so of my work, I've been more and more aware of exactly this problem. And uh, what's happened more recently is that particularly among American systematic theologians, um, ones that I've read anyway, there is a sense that, ah, the world is becoming more secular and there's a real danger of being sucked down into a, a flat land where we deny the supernatural and we simply concentrate on the present world. And they sometimes accuse me of that, which is ridiculous, but still. And so then people are saying, we've got to learn from Plato. We've got to learn about the supernatural world from Plato and about how our souls are designed to be at home in heaven. That's where we're really supposed to be going. As though the Bible didn't have its own metaphysical structure and ontology built in from the Old Testament and coming through again and again into the new, in which heaven and earth uh, God's space and our space are meant to come together. They're meant for each other and they're meant to, to work together. Um, that's the final goal. When the earth shall be full of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea, according to various passages in the Old Testament. And when Paul talks about inheritance in Romans 8, for years I had assumed that the Christian inheritance meant going to heaven. And then it becomes quite clear, and it's clear already in Romans from chapter 4, that God promised Abraham an inheritance which wasn't heaven, it was the world. In other words, the holy land which Abraham was promised was designed, according to Paul, but actually you can see this going on in the Old Testament as well, as a foretaste, a forward pointer towards God's claim on the whole creation. So that in Romans 8, when Paul is talking about the inheritance, he is emphasizing that this is the entire created order. Well, at the moment, the entire created order is in a mess. And he doesn't say, well, fortunately, God will snatch us out of there fairly soon and take us off to be with him. Rather, God by the Spirit is already indwelling us, his people, so that we can be people of prayer at the place where the world is in pain, so that God may redeem this present suffering world. Um, and that's how we are already anticipating our inheritance as the royal priesthood, if you like, that we are supposed to be sharing in God's wise rule and the priestly ministry of his people within and for the present creation as it needs redeeming. So this is a way of saying, please, can we actually go with the Bible rather than with Plato's philosophy? And those theologians who say, no, 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 in order to understand the Bible, you need Plato. I want to say, I'm sorry, that is simply not the case. And if you bring Plato into the argument, then, OK, he'll give you a vision of a supernatural world, but that's not the biblical vision of how God's space and our space work together. So the ultimate goal is, yes, that we are to be God's true humanity, redeemed, resurrected, living in his new creation, which is the present world remade. That is our inheritance. And um, yeah, that changes everything. Yeah, very <laughs> early in the book, you say we are saved not from the world, but for the world. And yeah. you know, the popular view that salvation is about going to heaven after we die results in, and you've written about this elsewhere, results in a view that, okay, if that's my destiny, if that's what this is all about, then all I really need to be concerned about right now is living morally and to be a good, well-behaved yeah. Christian before I get to escape from this place. And a lot of people read Romans, and Romans 8 in particular, with that lens, but you say this chapter isn't primarily about salvation, it's about vocation, it's about our calling in the world. Um, and you've already hinted at this a little bit, but sketch out how that fits in the larger biblical narrative from Genesis, Exodus, yep. Israel, and then what we see Paul doing in Romans. It's, it's a very exciting picture, and I much regret that the fine Christian traditions in which I grew up, the Anglican tradition and then more specifically evangelical British tradition, uh, really didn't pick this up at all. But um, Paul is emphatic in Romans 8 verses 12 through 30, which is the great long central section of this chapter. You know, you've got 1 to 11, which is about how we there is no condemnation and 
by the Spirit we are going to be raised from the dead. You've got 831 to 39, who shall say anything against God's elect? It is God who justifies and so on. Those give you the framework. But in between, he says, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. And then he doesn't quite say who we are debtors to. But as the passage unwinds, it is clear we are indebted to God who has rescued us and the way we repay God's debt is by becoming the genuine human beings through whom God is at work in the world. I was actually preaching on this on Sunday night, just uh, three three nights ago from where we are recording this, um, because I was preaching for uh, a family member who's celebrating the 50th anniversary of his ordination. And so I preached about vocation, and I took it all the way back to the doctrine of the image of God in Genesis 1, where when God wants to make his wonderful heaven plus earth creation, he puts within that creation a creature who will reflect him into the world and reflect the praises of the world back to him. In other words, humans are designed to be the means of God doing what God wants to do in the world. Of course, God does a thousand other things without us. We, it was neither you nor I made the sunrise this morning, uh, etc., etc. But all sorts of things that God wants to do, he, uh, from the beginning, purposed to do them through human beings. Why did he do that? You know, so often when we've had these arguments, we've started with a kind of 18th century deist view. There is God upstairs. If God is going to do it, why doesn't God just get on and do it? Oh, well, he sort of wants to involve us in some way. No, it's not like that. When we think biblically, we realize that God made a world with this creature within this world who was going to be able perfectly to express God's will and purposes in order that it would be utterly appropriate for God himself to come in the person of his son to be the truly human one. Paul sums this up in verse 29 of chapter 8, where he says that Jesus, uh, we, we are to be conformed to the image of the son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And this idea of the image then goes with the picture, which is also there in Romans 8, of creation as temple that a heaven plus earth structure with an image at its heart, everyone in the ancient world would know this is a temple. And the image is there, as I said, to reflect the power and presence of God into the world and to reflect the praises and very clearly in Romans 8, the lament of the world back to God. And that focus on lament is really quite important yeah. as the chapter gets yeah. towards its climax. I want to talk about that in, in a few minutes. But before yeah. we get there, I want to go back to yeah. the, the, the temple imagery and specifically, um, Paul speaks about the creation itself sharing in the glory of the children of God. Uh, there's a lot to unpack with that, but what when, when most people read about glory or glorification or sharing in the glory of Christ, all those things, we often have uh, storybook images of beams of bright light and, you know, in a celestial paradise and that sort of thing. What does Paul mean by glory and glorification? And in what wow. way does the creation share in our glory? Yes, um, I think if you if you go back, you'll see that in my translation, which is the one I use in this book, and by the way, um, I don't know if you're aware, there's a new edition of my translation, the New Testament for Everyone, which is being published next week along with this book, and that's got um, a few key um, uh, alterations in this passage because of fresh work that I've done. But um, the, 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 the creation um, doesn't exactly share the glory the creation is waiting for the children of God to be revealed. Um, uh, where are we? Yeah, the creation itself will be freed from its slavery to decay, to enjoy the freedom that comes when God's children are glorified. Because what Paul is doing there, he's tracking with Psalm 8. This is something I owe to one of my graduate students when I was teaching in St. Andrews, who was quite determinedly pursuing this line. And then in her thesis um, was able to say, Professor Wright seems to ignore this in his commentary, which I thought, OK, go for it. That's, <laughs> that's absolutely fine. I like it when my students show their independence. <clears throat> but it's exactly right. In Psalm 8, <clears throat> the human vocation goes like this. We are made little lower than the angels to be crowned with glory and honour 
with all things put in subjection under our feet. Paul has already quoted that glory and honour bit back in chapter 2. And the glory there, as you rightly say, isn't about shining like an electric light bulb. This is glory as in the human dignity of being put in charge of God's world. Uh, and, you know, the ancient world, when a king was made a king, they put a crown on his head as a kind of symbol that really he was reflecting uh, the rays of God's glory or something like that. But it didn't mean that the king had a spotlight on him all the time. It meant he was in charge. And that's that's the glory. So that when God's children are raised from the dead and are thereby given glory, which means the sovereign rule over the world. Go back to Romans 5.17, where Paul says that those who receive the gift of righteousness will reign in life. That's the rule through which the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to to decay, to enjoy the freedom that comes when God's children are glorified. Now, a lot of the translations just say to share the glory. Um, And then you do get exactly as you implied, a kind of splashy, generalized version of everything being surrounded in 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 a bright, vivid light. Now, of course, at the same time as you have the human glory, which is humans being put in authority over the world, if you'd said to a first century Jew, what is the hope of glory? They would almost certainly have said, we are waiting and it's been a long time in coming for Yahweh himself, our God, to come back at last to his temple. The Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, said Malachi, but nobody in the second temple period said it had happened yet. So I see here a convergence, a convergence between the glory, which is what God purposed for his human creatures, and the glory which is the return of Yahweh to Zion, coming back to the temple. But what is the temple? Well, the temple is the ultimate new creation with these human beings, with Jesus at the center of that picture, at the heart of this new world. So I think the glory which is God's glory, which they're waiting for for its return, and the glory which is the destiny of humans, are made for one another. And if we puzzled about that, we just have to think of Jesus um, uh, and think of Philippians 2 and the many other passages which speak of Jesus, the human one, being glorified. And uh, obviously, again, that doesn't mean shining like an electric light bulb. I mean, you've got the transfiguration, etc. No doubt there may be transformations in, in terms of luminosity, That's, but that's not the point. Yeah. The point is he is gloriously in charge, and therefore the world is being put right. It's remarkable once you know you do this so well is is to see how much Paul is relying on the Old Testament, especially the Exodus, and even Genesis. You've mentioned it already, but at the beginning, the man and woman are giving dominion, authority over the earth as God's representatives. That's your understanding of glory. You see it at Revelation, where we are to reign with Christ upon the earth. So yeah. our understanding of glory or glorification as authority and dignity over the earth, it's its all there in the Bible already. We've just yeah, ignored it. Um, yeah. Let's talk about, let's go back to the lament idea. Because, again, when people hear glorification, even with your definition, the biblical definition of authority and dignity and, and, and dominion, we can get grandiose and we can think um, you know, spectacularly about these things. But the way in which we are conformed to the image of the Son and the way in which we fulfill our vocation of, of our priestly vocation is representing God on the earth and, the, and representing the earth back to God you say is is often through lament. Um, unpack that and explain where that's rooted in Romans 8. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's a fascinating thing, but if you look back at commentaries, including, I think, the commentaries that I myself have written in the past, you'll see that those two little verses, verses 26 and 27, about prayer often tend to be treated as a separate paragraph, as though Paul has said this rather odd stuff about creation groaning, etc. And then we have, oh, and the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses because we don't know how to pray, but the Spirit groans on our behalf. And, And people have treated that as an extra, almost like an aside. 
I see it as the very heart of where Paul's argument is going, because if we are put in authority over the world, then, as the letter to the Hebrews says, we don't yet see that working out. Of course, humans are able to organise the world in various ways, though we so often get it horribly wrong as well. But the Christian vocation is to be the people who are called to stand in prayer at the place where the world is in pain. And I see this as deeply Christological, that like Jesus going to the cross, crying, my, my God, why did you abandon me? So the Spirit is God himself coming to dwell at the heart of his suffering creation. How does he do that? By dwelling in our hearts so that when we are aware of the pain of the world, and we're recording this at a time when there's huge angst going on uh, around the world, focused on the Middle East as well as on Ukraine and so on, that, that this is so appropriate that, that our task is not necessarily to solve it all overnight, wish we could, but rather to be in the prayer of, of, of wordless lament. The extraordinary thing in that passage is that Paul says that faced with the terrible evil and groaning and travel of, of creation, even God the Holy Spirit doesn't have words to say how appalling it is. But the, the wordless groaning, stenagmois alaletois in Greek, the groanings which can't come into articulate speech, these are heard by God the Father. And so we are to be caught up in the inner trialogue, if you like, of the Trinity, because we are shaped according to the pattern of, of Christ himself, who went to the cross to be at the heart of where the world is in pain, and, and the groaning that we experience in our own lives, which resonates with the pain of the world, we are to know that God the Father hears that because he knows the secrets of the hearts. He, she, he, he sees what's going on in the depths. And in that confidence, we can move through the rest of Romans because Paul is there quoting, Romans, uh, quoting Psalm 44, which he quotes later on in the chapter, for your sake we are being killed all day long. And there's, I see this as the heart of the Christian vocation, to be the people who stand in prayer, even when we don't, we, we, we haven't got a solution. We just say, Lord, have mercy. And sometimes it's hard even to say that. But that is what we're called to do and be, uh, so that the lament of the world, like the groaning of the children of Israel in Egypt, may come to the ears of the Lord of hosts, and that in his mercy he will resolve the situation however is appropriate. So when I was a seminary student 25 years ago uh, here in the U.S., I was reading books given to me by some of my professors about mission and church growth was a big deal in the late 90s. And a lot of what was emphasized there was the importance of the church being a place of consistent and constant celebration. And I was given no theology of lament no understanding of our Christian vocation as being a, a priests who, who are a conduit for the grief and pain of the world to God and God's presence back to the world. But you write this on page 139. You say, I understand that some churches eager to attract newcomers have majored on happy, bouncy music, but without the biblical call to lament, we are failing in our calling. What does that look like in, uh, for a local community of believers, for a congregation, yeah. for even us individually. Yeah. I mean, obviously, there are things to celebrate. There are times to be joyous. Yeah. But yeah. what does lament look like as a ministry? I'm so glad you draw that out because I'm very much aware of that in many churches here in Oxford and in Wycliffe Hall, where I help, uh, which is one of the local Anglican seminaries. The, the, the temptation, I think it is a temptation, is always to be singing a cheerful, upbeat song saying how great God is, how great his redemption is, uh, what a wonderful thing he's done for us in Christ. And of course, all that's true. And many of those songs are splendid, and I'm very happy to sing them. But if you look at the Bib biblical prayer book, which is the book of the Psalms, mm -hmm. then I don't know what the statistics are, but there's probably just about as many psalms of lament as there are psalms of ebullient cheerfulness, and there's many in between. And 
It's worried me for a long time that many in my own Anglican tradition have gone the route of really ignoring the Psalms or, or saying, well, they're really rather difficult and we want seekers to be able to come in and be, be happy here and, and they won't understand all this rather dark stuff. Um, to which my response is, every seeker who comes through the door and every older person who is still hanging in there and coming to church after many years, they all carry some sorrow with them, whether it's on the surface or whether it's deep down in their hearts or whether it's strange longings that they can't explain or or, or th things that where they think the world has gone wrong and they're in the wrong place. And so always to be cheerful and say, come on, we're going to sing these nice happy things. Well, that's OK. There's plenty to celebrate, but it doesn't actually scratch where they're itching. Um, and uh, I think we need the, the larger vision of, of lament. And I, I said in my sermon on Sunday night, um, lament is actually part of worship in this sense that, and this is going slightly beyond what I said in the book, because unless you believe in God as the creator, the life giver, the redeemer, etc., then there's no point even lamenting. You just throw up your hands and say, the whole world's a mess, I have no idea what to do. Lament implies that we are coming to God, like the Psalms do, and say, Lord, please wake up, it's time to do something. We're in a mess, um, you have made promises to us, we are lamenting the fact that we don't see how they're being worked out. But in other words, lament itself implies worship, but a very realistic worship, um, and it's rather like when the disciples wake up Jesus, who's asleep in the bottom of the boat while they're being tossed to and fro. Hey, wake up, do something about it. And the Psalms use exactly that language. Again, Psalm 44 does that um, spectacularly. And I think to, to encourage folk, not least those going into ministry, actually, uh, that it's OK to factor in lament. We need some fresh worship songs of lament but we also need to recover ways of singing the psalms, uh, all the psalms or just about all the psalms. And I know there are many people who are now doing that, but we've, we've got to go back to that. And especially if the world is moving, as it seems to be, into a time of really sociopolitical chaos again, which is a very dangerous and scary thing. That those of us who grew up in the 50s, 60s, 70s, etc., We've thought that the world is actually getting a better place and we've sort of solved most of the problems, a few little glitches here and there. And, and no, it's not like that anymore. And we need the lament in order to, in to wisely to inhabit God's world as prayerful worshipping Christians. Okay, so this takes us to uh, the verse I really wanted to get to, the one that I'm sure most of our <laughs> right. listeners are aware of that gets yeah. pulled out of its context all the time and applied to various uh, lamentable situations, and that's Romans eight twenty eight. Um, yeah, surprise, 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 <laughs> surprise. So I was, I had to read this part of the book really slowly because I really wanted to understand your argument here, and I know you're you're basing your research on that work of others as well. Um, first, explain the popular interpretation of Romans eight twenty eight before we get into yeah. the correct interpretation. Sure, sure. OK, the popular interpretation, which I grew up with, and I learned Romans 8.28 when I was a teenager, you know, is one of the key mm -hmm. verses that one learned, which in the King James Version goes something like, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. Now, in other words, if you're in the right place with God, then whatever happens, it's going to pan out. And it puts the all things as the subject of the verb, as though all things are just crunching along finding their own way and will work themselves out like a, an automatic jigsaw puzzle. It looks a mess at the moment, but just watch those pieces. They will come rushing together. And if you're in the right place with God, you'll see that your jigsaws yeah, will work the, out. The way I was taught and, this as a teenager was the metaphor of a, a tapestry or a rug, and you're looking at the back of the rug uh, and it looks like a mess and you can't tell that once it's flipped over, though, you see the beautiful intentional pattern and that yeah. that's often how it's taught. Which which I think that image goes back to John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. Oh, right, or right, right. Somewhere. But, but yes, that, that is. And, you know, I don't want to be rude about that way of reading the verse because there are many Christians whose faith has been sustained in dark times through that reading of the verse. And you know, just as when I look back at sermons that I've preached and things that I've said over the last 50 years of ministry, 
um, I think, oh my goodness, I hope no one was too badly misled by what I said. God is gracious and can work through half understood things, which is just as well, otherwise all we preachers ought to give up. But, 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 actually the verse is a typically dense bit of Paul's prose, and the sub but the subject of the verb is God, that God works all things for good, but then it isn't to those who love God, it's with those who love God, because the Greek verb is sun ergi, and the erg bit means to work, and the syun bit means with. And there's no doubt about that. If you look up words with the uh, syn at the beginning of them, or uh, sigma upsilon nun in Greek, then they are with words. And of course, the church has been worried about that. Theologians have been worried about that, because if we're talking about salvation, we don't want to have any of that nasty synergism which says, well, God does half of it, and then I have to do half of it as well. But this is where the, the fact comes in that, that this passage is not about salvation, it's about vocation, as you rightly said before. And, and that the vocation which Paul has been talking about is the way in which in the present time, through suffering and prayer at the place where the world is in pain, so that the triune life of God may be indwelling in us. That's what Paul means by those who love God. And what he's saying in this verse is that when people are doing this, then God is working all things together for good with those who thus love him, who are called according to his purpose. He's called, it is the vocation that we are called to be the people through whose intercessory spirit-led ministry God is doing what he wants to do in the world. I hope that's clear. I've lectured about this two or three times this last year, and I'm aware that it doesn't always come out as clearly as it might, because it is a complicated little bit of Greek as well. But I hope that uh, that kind of hits the spot. It, it is a complicated bit of Greek, but it's also not the only place where Paul talks this way. Uh, in Ephesians, he speaks about us being saved for good works that God has ordained in, ad Absolutely. in advance for us to do. So this notion, I think it is important that when we come at this text through the lens of salvation, it can freak people out with their Reformed theology that it feels like yep. this is a works righteousness, what are we contributing to our salvation? Yep. But when we come at it with calling or vocation, we understand that, of course, God is at work with his people to do good things in the world and to bring yep. healing and, and marks of his kingdom and all of that. Um, okay, before we wrap up, one of the themes that you, uh, well, this has been present throughout your scholarship, is the importance of reading Paul in his first century Jewish context, rather than through the lens of medieval European theological questions. But one of the ways that comes out clearly in this book is you argue that Paul is actually uh, mapping the narrative of the Exodus onto the central chapters of Romans, um, God rescuing his people from Egypt, God calling them and giving them the law, um, the, the tabernacle and the filling of God's presence, all that. Can you explain a little bit how that works in Romans, maybe from a higher altitude, and why it is we fail yeah, to yeah. recognize that? Yeah, we we'll get in our drones and go up to 10,000 <laughs> right. feet and look down from above. Um, th this struck me many years ago, and I've tried to work it out in various places, but I see more and more of it now. And that is that when Paul is constructing Romans 5 to 8, Romans 5 functions as an introduction. It's kind of a double introduction, 5, 1 to 10, 5, um, 12 to 21. But in particular, the whole Adam Christ picture. And then having done that, uh, this is where we're going. He's going to come back to the Adam Christ theme in Romans 8. But then he tells the story of the Exodus. And Romans 6 it begins by talking about how we come through the water as a result of which the slaves get freed. In other words, the waters of baptism mean that those who are enslaved to sin are set free from that slavery to live as the, the, the living, serving people of God. But then, after the children of Israel come through the waters of the Red Sea, they land up on Mount Sinai, which in the Old Testament... Uh, narrative itself is a deeply ambiguous time because God has given them the Torah in order to shape them to be the people in whose midst he can come and dwell in the tabernacle. But 
as we know from any straight-on reading of Genesis to Deuteronomy, and there are many Jews in Paul's day who are looking at the Pentateuch as a whole, by the time you get to Deuteronomy, it isn't, so there we are, everything's fine, you're going to the promised land, job done. It's, oh no, you are a sinful, rebellious people, and though you are going into the promised land, uh, you are going to find that because you will go on rebelling, you will end up going into exile, and it's only after that exile that you'll be brought back, and then God will give you a new heart, and so on. But the Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32, which is one of Paul's favorite passages of the Old Testament, is not so cheerful at all. It's very much about, you know, you're a sinful, stiff-necked people, you're going to have to watch out. So in Romans 7, you get the giving of Torah, and then the life of Israel under Torah, ending up precisely in exile. Ironically for me, because I've worked on this theme for many years, but it's only fairly recently that I've joined those dots, as one or two scholars have done, that when Paul says, I see another law in my members taking me captive to the law of sin, the word he uses for taking me captive, eikmelotid zontemi, is the word which again and again and again in the Greek Old Testament Bible is the word for exile. Mm -hmm. In other words, Paul is telling the story of Israel having been given the Torah and then ending up in exile. Now what's going to happen? Well, God is gracious and he's going to do the Deuteronomy 30 thing. He's going to redeem, he's going to rescue. And in particular, since the giving of the Torah was always designed to prepare for God's coming to dwell in the midst of his people, what we find in chapter 8, through Christ and the Spirit, is, if you like, the new temple. When Paul uses temple language of the Spirit in chapter 8, verses 9 to 11, we should pick up those overtones, which would be abundantly clear to anyone with Paul's background and, and, and scriptural knowledge, that the indwelling, God dwelling in the tabernacle, God dwelling in the temple. Now, the Spirit of the one who raised Jesus now dwells in you, therefore he will give life to your mortal bodies. This is like the destruction and rebuilding of the temple. And so that then launches us on the central passage of vocation, where Paul again does the thing where, okay, we are the new Exodus people, so we're on the way, we are being led by the Spirit to the inheritance. Well, exactly, but it's not the promised land anymore, it's to the inheritance, as we said half an hour ago, which is the whole world. And in that process, we are still Exodus people because we are still people who share the groaning as with the children of Israel in, in the wilderness. So basically, uh, the, 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 old, the old truths come back that uh, if you want to understand the New Testament, you really have to soak yourself in the old. Um, but actually, this isn't about a proof text here and a proof text there. It's about whole right. large narrative themes. And we, particularly in the Protestant tradition, haven't wanted to know about the temple. It's a bit too churchy, maybe a bit too Catholic, but as, a bit too Jewish, heaven help us. But as far as Paul is concerned, the idea of the church as the new temple and of the spirit as God himself, as he promised, coming back to dwell in that new temple, that actually holds the whole thing together and drives forward to that glorious paean of praise at the end of the chapter. Well, a couple things come to mind as we wrap up here. One is, uh, you know, we, we are a few days, we're recording this a few days after the, the horrible attack that's occurred in Israel and, and a lot of conversation occurring right now about the, the ongoing struggle of anti-Semitism that exists in the world. And it makes me wonder if the anti-Semitism that's existed in the church in different forms for the last thousand years has seriously perverted our reading of the New Testament, because we've been so reluctant to be shaped by those Old Testament narratives that so deeply formed Paul's imagination and led to the brilliance of his writing in the New Testament, we just have ignored that for, for the inherited anti-Semitism that's infected the West for far too long. Yeah. The other thought I have is I wish we could do this more and talk about the entire book of Romans together because I really want to go into 9, 10, 11 to hear how you uh. understand Paul's writing about Israel in light of <laughs> what we've just covered. Um, but, Tom, I'm so incredibly indebted. For, I've been indebted since seminary to your scholarship and writing. It has, it has informed so much of my own work in ministry and my, my faith. So thank you for this new work that is this incredibly deep dive. Thank into you Romans very 8. much. It's, it's, 
It, it's very it's very good to talk. Um, I can't remember when we last talked, but it's very good to see you again and to be able to engage with this. And and if you want to know what I think about nine, ten, and eleven, um, chapter eleven in my big book, Paul and the Faithfulness of God, sets it all out at some length. And I don't think I've changed my mind on any of that <laughs> since I wrote it. Um, I may have done, but I don't think so. So uh, well, that would be the place to start. The fact that you do change your mind from time to time is is a sign of your humility and ongoing uh, curiosity, which is a, a huge benefit to all of us. Thank you so much for being with us. Bless you. The Holy Post Podcast is a production of Holy Post Media. Production assistance by Mike Stralo. Editing by Area Code Audio. Help us create more thoughtful Christian media by subscribing to Holy Post Plus at holypost.com slash plus. Also, be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcasts so more people can discover thoughtful Christian commentary plus ukulele and occasional butt news. Visit holypost.com for show notes, news stories, Holy Post merchandise, and much more.